Welcome, age of vintage society. Hollywood is a den of death. It offers fleeting amusements which almost always enthrall its stars. Jenny Maxwell couldn't resist Hollywood's temptations, and her life became the payment for her lack of control. Why Jenny Maxwell's case made the police crazy! I want you to know, my viewers, how much I appreciate your generous support on Patreon and your activity on the channel. These videos would not have been possible without you. Big thanks to those who watched the video until the end. If Hollywood filmmakers are looking for ideas for riveting scripts, they shouldn't bother as much. All they need is to pay attention to the Hollywood stars around them and they'll get enough material for an interesting script that could even have sequels. Look at Jenny Maxwell. Her life had every bit of material for a film. There was love, divorce, fierce custody battles, hard partying, cheating, then love again, sloth, greed, sleazy lawyer, more cheating, mob links, and eventually death. All of these words carry a story that began when the delectable Jenny became an actress. The blonde-haired actress was thrust into Tinseltown too early and was caught up with being an exuberant young woman that it led to her making unwise choices that ended with two bullets. One in her head splattering her brains out and the other in her eye, scooping out what the bullet to her head may have missed. Pow! 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 The air rang with three shots and a yell on the 10th of June 1981. The shopkeeper nearby acted as a hero. Against all instincts of self-preservation, he dashed right to where the danger was. The shopkeeper saw a man staggering outside of a condo, and when he went inside, he saw the splattered remains of a woman. The man the shopkeeper saw staggering outside was Irvin Tip Roder, an ex-cop turned sleazy lawyer with mob links, and the woman would later be identified as Jenny Maxwell, the blonde bombshell who had once been one of the most sought-after actresses of the time. So great was her star power that the media began to parrot that beautiful blonde beauty was a relative of the sexy Marilyn Monroe. It was just a fad. The two weren't related. The police arrived at the scene and after investigation they declared that it was a robbery gone wrong. It was a clean job. There wasn't a suspect and like that the case got closed. But for Jenny's family and Detective Mike Thiers, the case wasn't. Mike didn't believe it was a robbery gone wrong. Jenny adorned herself with expensive jewellery and none of it was taken off her. It couldn't be a robbery, the detective opined, but there was nothing he could do in the absence of a suspect, so he moved on. Other cases required his attention. Jenny's family didn't. They turned to one person who had the possible connections to get to the truth, Buddy Morehouse, the child of Vera, Jenny's cousin. In her grief, Vera charged her son to help them find the truth. It was Buddy who revealed to the family that the media reduced it to just another robbery gone wrong, back when he was an aspiring journalist in college. It was he that carried the family's burden of finding the truth for the sake of closure for 40 years. Morehouse was a trained journalist who clamped his jaws tight on the mystery, determined not to let go. The killing didn't look normal. It looked like an execution, a mob-styled execution, and if there was someone who was a gangster wannabe, it was Tip, so the big question was, did Tip offend a rival gang and they try to off him in vengeance? Remember, Tip was also a lawyer. He might have mishandled a mobster's case. He didn't. What happened was more sinister. Tip and the beautiful Jenny met at the point when Jenny decided to take control of her life and not make any more bad decisions. It is ironic that despite knowing that Tip was a sneaky man and a gangster wannabe, she was still attracted to him, and there was a single emotion powering her attraction to him. Greed thought to be love. Despite being an actress with immense potential, the blonde bombshell had squandered not only her wealth, but opportunities that came to her. As Morehouse said, she had things that other actresses would kill for. She had the kind of life that they would just kill for, and she just apparently wasn't ready to handle any of it. So, when people described her husband's nature to her, she didn't listen. What mattered to her was Irvin was immensely rich. He had done several high-profile divorce cases, managed Nick Adams, who would have died of overdose if not for Tip, and he also had connections with Louis C. Blau, 
the legendary agent of Stanley Kubrick, Barry Gordy and Lana Turner. The two continued their relationship and even at the dating stage it didn't look like a healthy relationship with numerous breakups and make-ups. The two married and luxury came to meet the actress. She designed her new Beverly Hills home to look like a safari and felt bliss. It didn't last. When the two married it didn't surprise anyone that they fought. They were generations apart, with Irvin being twenty years older than his wife. This age difference inspired different hobbies. Irving came from an era where he had to posture to be strong by associating with mobsters and eating expensive meals in the same restaurants with them. He was a bold man, and his nature as a fearsome lawyer depended on how much of a strong man people viewed him. His wife, Jenny, was younger and was more interested in throwing parties which Irving found dreary to attend. The two didn't bond and weren't close in the first place. Their marriage was one of convenience. To tip the sexy actress was a statement that he could pull high-value women, and for Maxwell it was about comfort. The two cheated on each other and they didn't hide it. According to friends, Jenny would regale Rhoda with details of her dalliances. Wow, Jenny was a naughty girl and she didn't hide it. But by the eighth year of their marriage she wanted out. However, her lawyer had a plan. He told her to wait two more years before she divorced Tip. The reason? So she could get more settlement. Although by this time the two had separated and returned to each other multiple times. The petite actress had her eyes on the prize and two more years was all it took. As soon as the marriage clocked ten, Jenny played the dissolution card and so the divorce battle began. Jenny had bought a condo and moved in to live by herself. She was preparing for a new life. Little did she know she was preparing for her death. Her husband would rather kill her than pay her any settlement. Or so did Morehouse claim. It is my intention that Jennifer Helen Roder will receive nothing upon my passing. I do not want a lying, cheating, deceitful woman to profit, Irvin said. No one knew he meant it with every fibre of his being. He meant it enough to be shot for it. Yes, Tip hired a hitman to shoot him and his wife. At least that was what Morehouse alleged. He prepared for this right under everyone's noses. But how could everyone suspect what he was doing? It didn't make sense at the time, but after the death of Jenny it did. The sleazy lawyer became distant, and he bore a scar that he was quiet about. Irvin only reported it when it gathered attention, and he chalked it down to a gunshot wound by an armed robber that came to his house. That wound was a crucial hint to what he was planning. Detective Thighs tried to move on, but he couldn't. He continued to work on the case, putting twos together. However, the media no longer cared about the actress who had more or less fizzled out of stardom. Thighs told Morehouse that his investigation revealed something they missed at first. Not willing to let go of this mystery, he met with Irvin's friend, and he learned that the ex-cop had been looking for hitmen that could shoot Jenny and a lover. The lover was none other than himself. These associates claimed they didn't offer Irvin the services he needed, but turned out he allegedly got it. Rhoda picked Jenny up after she did a small surgery and needed a ride home. Rhoda came around and offered to drive her to her condo. It was shortly after they arrived at the condo that the hit took place. Rhoda thought he had saved money from going to Jenny, but supposedly he didn't count on one thing. What Irvin didn't count on was the shooter not aiming carefully enough just to graze him. Instead, the shooter hit Rhoda in the guts, causing him to suffer immensely before he died. And so their story ended. Jenny's knack for bad decisions eventually brought about her demise. Jennifer Helen Maxwell, best known as Jenny Maxwell, was born in Brooklyn, New York, on September 3, 1941, to Norwegian immigrant parents. Jenny was their only child, and so they lavished her with the labours of their hard work. Coddled, Jenny only knew a comfortable life, and it is this pursuit of comfort that would lead to her untimely death many years later. While she didn't come from Hollywood royalty or vaudevillian parents, the lure of Hollywood was too irresistible for her. She loved acting, and her parents, not used to saying no to their petite, beautiful blonde daughter, enrolled her in Violet Hill School of Drama in Brooklyn to get acting lessons. Jenny was brilliant, and it didn't take time for more important people to begin to take note of her brilliance. Visiting her drama school, Vincent Minnelli, a Hollywood filmmaker, 
saw her and marvelled at her acting chops and her beauty. He believed she was ripe for Hollywood. He convinced her instructor to let her audition. Excited, Jenny jumped at the opportunity. It was her chance to become a star. She auditioned for the film Some Came Running, which had superstars like Frank Sinatra, but she suffered her first disappointment. The director of the film, Minelli, didn't pick her, and it was for a bizarre reason too, her hair. The director felt the role didn't need a blonde. However, her disappointment didn't last a day. Auditions upon auditions came. The next day she got an audition for a role in the TV series Bachelor Father. She landed the role and it would be the first of many. Some of her other appearances would be in Death Valley Days, My Three Sons, Route 66, 77 Sunset Strip, The Wild Wild West, The Twilight Zone, Bonanza, and Father Knows Best. Have you seen any of them? It was on the set of Father Knows Best that she met Paul Rapp. Paul was 24 and an assistant director. Also, he came from a top comedy script writer, Philip Rapp. Jenny went to Tinseltown alone as her parents refused to move to California with her. Left alone without guidance and to her own devices, Jenny's youthful exuberance got the best of her. On a whim and filled with love, Jenny married Paul. It was a battle-filled union. They woke up to fights and ended with fights. Jenny didn't know what it meant to be a wife. She just wanted to party and have the time of her life. It didn't mix with what a wife should be. Added to this was infidelity. Jenny reportedly had one-night stands at the expense of her husband. Still, despite their constant arguments, Jenny managed to get pregnant, and if you thought motherhood would change her, you are wrong. She was a teen mum, and the recklessness of youth still filled her veins. As soon as she gave birth, she returned to the party lifestyle harder than before. It didn't help that childbirth seemed to make her even more appealing. Right after giving birth, she won the Hollywood Deb Star in 1960. Her star grew, and with it, her recklessness. She would abandon her child at home to terrorise the streets of Tinseltown. Paul said no more. Then he decided to divorce. It was a fierce battle that had the actress winning the custody of their child, Brian. Jenny didn't fight for Brian because she wanted to mother him. She just wanted to piss Paul off. Brian suffered at her hands and it got so bad that Jenny's mum had to go and testify against her before a judge that she was irresponsible. Jenny lost Brian and got visitation rights and hatred for her mum. She had already drifted from her family, but this was the final straw. The star cut her parents off. After all, what did she need them for? She had braved the loneliness of Hollywood alone and found a new clan of reckless party-goers. Then, as if she hadn't lost enough, her career suffered as she developed a reputation for being a brat, unreliable and irresponsible. The roles dried up like the deserts of Nevada. From starring in awesome films like Blue Hawaii alongside Elvis, she starred in cheesy ones like Shotgun Wedding. Blue Hawaii was iconic, and while it wasn't the actress's breakout role, it was her biggest at the time. Also starring alongside the King of Rock and Roll, not many actresses had that honour. Blue Hawaii held a special place in the actress's heart. She played a character similar to how she was in real life. She played the role of a brat that almost drowned herself, and Elvis had to spank her silly in the iconic scene to discipline the actress's character. Elvis, going for realism, spanked too hard, and that pain you see on the actress's face on the screen was real pain. He had to spank hard to make it look good, she said. Her bum smart so bad that she couldn't sit down on the horse properly for the next scene. Unfortunately, she also got into an onset accident that bruised her foot, but for days it was her bum that hurt. What did Elvis Presley put in his hand? How hard could he have spanked the actress? The actress, while given a walking stick for her bruised leg, said, The cane helps my sore foot, but it doesn't do anything for the seat of my real trouble. Thank goodness for the memory she made on Blue Hawaii, as it remained a beacon of positivity in a life full of bad decisions. After having fun and living her life, Jenny grew up. She wasn't surrounded by family any more and decided to retrace her steps. The first thing she did was make up with her parents, and when she fully repaired their relationship, she went to get her son. The actress was ready to be a mother now. To get her son, the actress sacrificed the thing that took her away from him in the first instance, 
her career, or what was left of it anyway. The actress now had time for her son, and the two had swell times together. However, in the end, she left her son in this world when she died, and didn't leave him anything of her wealth. She was in the process of divorcing her second husband, Tip, when she was murdered. Because the actress died first, her property went to her second husband as their divorce wasn't finalised, and she didn't have a will. After he died, the whole property went to his kids, leaving nothing for Jenny's son. In the end, she couldn't escape the consequences of her poor decisions. Now you know what was the Hollywood heartbreak behind the Jenny Maxwell story. Here is another interesting one. The enduring appeal of John Payne. Why did everyone love him? Watch this.